Day five of my five day for five pound budget challenge and I'm about to have breakfast but first I've got one or two things to prepare. So breakfast this morning is going to be my other two steamed buns and a few bits of fruit but I've got a couple of things I've got to prepare. So I've got some more of these split peas. I've got 75 grams of split peas. I'm going to grate up some carrots and then cook that together with my ration of curry paste, which is one tablespoon. I'm going to try to make a curry sauce and then dress some roasted vegetables in it to make that curry sauce go a little bit further because one tablespoon of curry sauce is not a great deal. Grating my carrots directly into the slow cooker to save on mess. And then normally I would say put that in the stock box, but actually that's going in a pan over here. And then, I don't know if this is a good idea or not, but I'm just going to grate in my other green banana. Not really sure I needed to grate it, because I think that will cook down to a pulp anyway. I don't really know what else to do with that banana, and I know bananas can go in a curry. I'm hoping that will give it a little bit of substance and texture to the sauce. And then the peas are also going to go in that. And now one tablespoonful of this curry sauce, curry paste rather. Okay, one tablespoonful of curry paste. And that's just gonna go into here with enough hot water to cover the peas and the vegetables. A little stir, lid on, and we'll cook that for four hours or so. Now, all through the week, I've been putting my vegetable trimmings and peelings in this box in the freezer. And I keep on saying, we're gonna make stock out of that. Today is the day we do that. All of that's going to go into a big saucepan. It can just go in there frozen like this. It is mostly onion skins and tops and tails, but peelings from other vegetables as well. And then we'll cover that with boiling water and bring that to the boil and simmer it for an hour and a half or something like that, just to get all the flavor out of there. And now back to breakfast, which is my remaining two steamed buns. And yeah, they're quite hard now. So these need to be warmed up and brought back to sort of being soft and steamy. This is a microwave safe steamer pot designed for steaming vegetables. And I'm just gonna put them in there. They don't really fit all that well. With about a couple of teaspoons of water, lid securely on, vent open, and that'll go in the microwave for two or three minutes. And I'm cooking that in the microwave at, for like a minute and then resting it for 30 seconds and then another minute until I feel like they're done. And while I'm doing that, I'm just gonna chop up some bits of fruit. Now I did start off the week saving my apple cores because I wasn't sure if I would need to use them. I'm not gonna do that now. I'm not actually gonna do anything with the apple cores. Can't think of a simple way to use those that appeals to me. So I'm just gonna put those in the compost now. With a lot of these leftovers that I've been saving, it's a case of saving them in case I'm, and until I know what I'm going to do with them. These have had two minutes now. I don't think that's going to be enough, but I'm just going to check on them. Oh, actually, it might be enough. Yep, they're springy again. Ouch, yeah. Okay, okay, that's breakfast. We'll get that to the table. I don't think there's going to be any surprises in the fruit bowl, but I will just have a look at these and see how well these steam buns have stood up to being reheated. Okay, camera wasn't even rolling for everything I just said. So... Let's go through that again. I'm just I cut these buns in half just to check that they are hot all the way through. And they are. And they're lovely and steamy inside and soft and fluffy. They definitely could have done with some more of that onion sauce because normally steamed buns have got kind of gravy oozing out of them. So they could have done with a bit extra sort of sauce or gravy or something in there. But they're still really nice. Interestingly today they are tasting a little bit under seasoned. I don't know if that's just the way the filling has kind of mellowed and, and combined with the flavors of the bread. They are still really good though. I'm gonna say not quite as enjoyable as yesterday. Definitely nicer cooked fresh, but there's not a lot in it. And these are still really nice. So that's breakfast, a little bit samey from yesterday's lunch, but sometimes it's worth doing that. Sometimes it's worth creating leftovers on purpose. Anyway, I've got some work to do now. But first, let's go and have a look at what you could have foraged. Today on Here's What You Could Have Foraged, I'll actually just have a look at uh, my moai head. In the winter, it grows some nice patina and a bird's pooped on it, which will help things to grow. Anyway, today on Here's What You Could Have Foraged, three-cornered leeks. 
a pernicious weed in my garden. This is a relative of onions and it's an onion flavoured weed. The only trouble with that is that it's growing in amongst things like snowdrops which are quite toxic and a bunch of other things as well so I would have to actually be really judicious about what I pick here. Bluebells, we've got all sorts of other things in here as well so I'd have to be really careful what I pick and I think at the back there that might be chickweed. We do get a lot of chickweed in this garden. And then rose hips. So we could make some rose hip tea. So that was, here's what you could have foraged, garden edition. Jenny's just pointed this out as well. This is crow garlic. Actually, didn't realize we had that in the garden. That's gonna have to come out or else we'll have that everywhere as well. That stock has been cooking for about an hour and a half now. And I could cook it for longer and some more flavor would come out of the vegetables, but also some of the aromatics would be driven off. So it's a case of balancing it. I find about an hour and a half of simmering for vegetable stock is just plenty. This is my straining setup, which is a bit elaborate, but there is method in my madness. So I've got a fine strainer and a colander on top of a big heat proof glass jug. Everything's just gonna go in there with a big label. The advantage of this is you get to see the color that's coming out of that stock as well. And then I can carefully press this down here to get some of the rest out. But I'll just leave that to drain. But look at the colour of that stock and nearly all of that has come from the onion skins. Some of it's come from the carrots. I'm going to leave that to strain now because it will continue to drip and I'm hoping that if I leave it it will actually clarify a little bit and I'll just pour off the clear stock at the top. And there we go. And of course that won't be as richly flavoured as a chicken stock or a beef stock but in its own right there's a lot of robust flavour in there. This stock has cooled down now a bit and it's not clarifying. I kind of hoped it would. So I'm gonna see what happens if we pass some of it through a coffee filter. I have plenty of stock here, more than I need for this recipe. So I'm gonna risk a little bit of it and see if it will go through a coffee filter. It seems to be going through. I don't know if it's gonna clear it. Yeah, I think it's clogging the filter now and I'm not gonna do the thing where you start stirring because you just end up perforating the filter. Just gonna let that settle. Don't know if you can hear that. There is a tiny bit of grit or sand in the bottom of this stock and that's probably come from the roots of the onions and maybe the carrot peelings as well. It's not a problem because it's just minerals. And that's why when I make stock, I always just pour off and just leave that last little dreg. Anything that could harm me because it's biological has been killed by the boiling. And the rest of it is just little pieces of rock which I'm not going to eat. Lunch is going to be soup and dumplings and so for this I want there to be little crispy bits of vegetables still inside the dumplings. So I've got to think about the size that I'm going to cut them. I don't expect these to cook completely through. In fact I think I might favour the midrib of these cabbage leaves. I'm expecting that they're going to still have a bit of bite and crispness to them when they're cooked. And then I'm also going to have a little bit of swede because again this is just like this is just like a radish really. And I'm gonna cut this into very, very fine little sticks. And then also a bit of onion. And again, thinking about the size of the pieces I want this to end up as. And then in with this, that one sausage that I took out for thawing earlier. I could have used more sausage than this, but I'm not really enjoying these sausages all that much. So I'm trying to make this more about the vegetables that go in there. That's the stuffing then for my little dumplings. And now I've got to make the dough. About 125 grams of flour. Not adding salt to this dough because there's going to be salt in the stock. Just adding enough water to make a firm dough. I think we might have done it. I'll knead that together. And as the dough becomes a little bit more sticky as I work it, I'm just going to get it to pick up all these little crumbs of dry dough. This looks like a dry dough, because it is, but it's going to be made into casings for dumplings, so it doesn't want to be too soft or else the, the filling will just pierce through. Uh, I think we'll divide that into... Let's have a look and see what sort, sort of size pieces we're going to divide that into. Eight. Yeah, 
I think that'll do. And my filling also, I'm going to divide into little pieces. Not a lot of filling in there, but it doesn't need to be. Wet around the edge there. And then we'll gather that up. Into a little bundle, like that. Pinch the top. Okay. So this idea of wrapping something tasty in a sheet of dough and then frying it or steaming it or boiling it is everywhere in the world. Dumplings, pot stickers, pierogi, uh, ravioli, gyoza. These aren't going to be exactly like any particular variation of dumplings that are fried or steamed or boiled. This idea exists all over the world. It's really quite interesting actually. Nearly every culture has something like this where it's basically something tasty and often a little bit expensive, wrapped up in a parcel of dough that's filling. And it's just a way of, I, I suppose, feeding a lot of mouths with an ingredient that might be not exactly cheap or plentiful. Anyway, I'm going to fry these in a little bit of lard so they get a bit of a crisp on the bottom. And then I'll add some stock. So yeah, I didn't invent this. I'm not even sure who did because it's kind of everywhere you look. Got. A little bit of browning happening on the bottom of these now. That's good. That will give us a bit of extra flavour. So now, and very carefully, I'm going to add some of my stock to that. This is not the stock that I clarified. This is the bit in the jug, so I'm being very careful not to get the bit that's got the grit in it. And I've got this lid, which is not the right lid for this pan, but it does fit. Wow, look at that. I'm going to add a little bit of salt just to this stock around the edge. Probably should have done that earlier, but didn't think of doing it. I reckon those are not far off done, actually. I'm going to probe the inside just to see, because obviously they've got sausage in there, so I just need to make sure that that sausage meat is fully cooked. Yeah, I reckon another two minutes. Possibly a tiny bit more stock. Two more minutes, which gives me just time to make my soup. How am I going to make soup in just two minutes? Well, kind of simple actually. So I want this to be actually a really fresh tasting soup. So I've got some grated carrot, which is going to be more or less raw in the soup. And I've got the remainder of my lettuce, which is still nice and fresh actually. That's done okay. And lettuce in a soup, well, I would prefer Chinese leaves, but what I have is lettuce. So that's the veg that's going to go in my soup. And those dumplings are definitely done now. So I'm just going to take them off the heat and just let them sit there because they'll be far too hot to eat straight off. This is the stock that I filtered using the coffee filter. And into that for seasoning, a bit of my Marmite broth, actually all of my Marmite broth, that's all gone now. And we'll just bring that up to temperature. So my soup is really as simple as that. And we've got these lovely dumplings here, which I can't wait to get into. So, soup. Wow, the stock. Almost too intense. There's a bit of bitterness there. And I think that's probably the problem when you make stock with too much of one ingredient. And in this one, I had lots and lots and lots of onion skins and not much else. And I think what we've got is one flavor has dominated and that's not always ideal. So we got a bit of bitterness from the onion skin there. It's still okay, it's tolerable, but I think a more balanced stock with different ingredients in there would probably be, have been better. That's all right though. Now, these dumplings. I'm gonna cut one open so we can have a look inside, but normally I suppose you just pick it up and bite into it. Oops, so it's, it's actually falling apart. Oh, that's no good. Okay, plan B, I'm just gonna bite one. Mm, they're good. They're a lot more fluffy than they would be if they were made with plain flour. 
So if you're making these with plain flour, you'd roll the dough a lot thinner and it would come out more like a sort of pasta. But these are nice. These are definitely the better part of the meal, I would say. That little bit of sausage meat in there actually works really well in here because it tastes like it's meant to be there. It just tastes like a bit of fatty pork, which is kind of what it is. Steam dumplings twice in one day. I think I might have to go for a long walk. Well, there's something you technically could forage, squirrels. I've eaten squirrel before, not much meat on them. Grey squirrels are classed as vermin in this country because they are not native. And that's not really what I've brought you down here for, actually. Here's something you could forage. Not so easy to see which is which at the moment, but in amongst here, some of these taller stems, the thicker stems here are reed mace, which has very distinctive cylindrical seed heads in fact sausage shaped seed heads when it's mature i think that's one there actually this thicker stem so, so under the ground there or under the mud there are really thick starchy roots that people have eaten before dig them up roast them and then they're very fibrous but you can kind of chew on them and get all the starch out of them i imagine they could be pounded and made into a sort of uh, processed starch as well so reed mace is another one and this plant down here with the heart-shaped leaves, this is garlic mustard. Not so easy to recognise when it's in this part of its growth phase. Much easier to recognise when it's flowering. But that's a kind of mustard cabbage family plant. Those leaves are edible, kind of taste a bit like uh, turnips. And again over there, that tuft of green there, that's grow garlic that we've seen quite a lot of this week. This is the curry sauce, such as it is, that I made from split peas, carrots, banana, and curry paste. I think it's gonna be probably quite a mild curry. Let's have a taste. Hmm, tiny bit of heat there, not much. Quite sweet, but okay, recognizably curry. I was gonna blend this completely, but I think what I'll actually do is just mash it so that some of those peas are broken up, because I think if I just mash that to a paste, I'm losing some of the texture. So I'm going to roast some vegetables later. I'll put that over the top of the roast vegetables and then reduce it down a bit. I have also got this mango that has been that was in the box. I'm not sure this is completely ripe, but today's the last day to use it. And I've got an apricot as well. So I'm going to open that up and see what it's like. So supposedly to open a mango, it's all the way round like that. Yeah, this is not very ripe. Yeah, no, I don't think this is going to be very ripe at all. We might have to cook this. Let's get in there on top of the seeds. Let's just have a go, see how right that is. Yeah, which is interesting that it was even in the box of produce that's kind of reduced down like that then, if it is so underripe. Makes you wonder I do wonder if there's a thing where they're making up these boxes of cheap veg almost as a kind of social venture just to make sure that people have got some affordable veg or a promotional thing or loss leader or something like that. It feels to me like some of the things in that box were still perfectly good and nowhere near the end of their expiry date. But then sometimes those expiry dates are just as, just as much about stock rotation as they are about the viability of the produce. Well, I'm not going to try and save any more flesh off of that. Yeah, underripe, but edible. So let's see if we can do that kind of fancy thing where you just dice the mango like this. What's the chances of this really working? <laughs> not really yeah and you can see that's not a ripe mango but I can make it into something okay I'm happy with that that's not a bad yield 
actually quite a lot of mango there. Probably should have used some of this in, earlier in the week, but I think it would have been even less ripe then. It's been in the fruit bowl with other fruit. I was hoping that would ripen it up, but really what it needs is time, not force. So my last apricot, which does look nice and ripe, so hopefully that will have some sweetness to it. And my last apple, which I have peeled, because really I find the peel tends to go a bit nasty when it's cooked. Grated apple, chopped apricot and diced mango. Tiny bit of water, just so it doesn't burn. And over a gentle heat, I'm just going to not stew this, I'm going to just soften it. We're getting to that time of day again where I'm going to lose the light, so everything's going to go into kind of um, 70s mode under artificial light in a minute. And I'm actually going to stop right there. So that's as much as that needs to be cooked, just really to release some juice out of it. Going to have some roasted vegetables now for dressing in a curry sauce. I'm going to parboil these to soften them so that they roast nicely. And I am going to peel them because they get a nicer surface texture when they're roasted that way. Okay, the carrots are going to go in the water first because they take longest. And I'm not going to boil them all the way. I'm just going to soften them on the outside a little bit because it just helps them to roast. Parsnip. Gosh, this parsnip's a little bit past its prime, but it's still okay. And potato. Again, I'm going to peel it because it roasts nicer if it's peeled, I find. Shall I have some swede? I don't know what swede's going to be like roasted. Never really done roasted swede before but we'll give it a go since we've got it here so hardest stuff in first which is carrots right swede in and I'll give that about two or three minutes just for those carrots to start to soften before I put the other things in also just remembered I've got part of an onion from lunch left over and I might as well use that before it spoils I think I'm just going to cut that into chunks like that And I'll put that straight in the roasting pan. Sweden carrots had about three minutes now. So now in with the parsnip and potato. And those won't need very much cooking. I'm not looking to cook them until tender. Yep, those are starting to soften. Okay, that's enough. So I'll take that off and drain it. Half my lard's gonna go into those drained vegetables and it will just melt in there. And to get the lard to coat the outside of the vegetables and give them a shake up that also kind of roughs up the surfaces of the potatoes which means that they hopefully will go a bit more crispy and then all of those just going to go into my roasting tin and in the oven probably for 20 minutes let's see what they look like after 20 minutes we've had about 20 minutes of cooking not enough color on there yet so i'm going to give those a little jiggle around I think we'll go back in for another 10 minutes. Okay, that's a bit more like it. So that's had about a total of about half an hour probably in a 200C fan oven. If I take it any further than that, those pieces of onion are gonna burn. I'm gonna add my curry sauce mixture, probably all of it, which lo looks incredibly unappetizing, but it's you know highly nutritious. And that's gonna go back in the oven now and uh, just until it bubbles and everything comes together. A bit more liquid than I want there, so I think maybe five more minutes in the oven. Which gives me time to sort my rice out, which is just the rice I cooked on a previous day, and I'm gonna reheat that in the microwave. Okay, that's dinner. Somebody will invariably tell me you shouldn't reheat rice. That's not true. You can reheat rice. You just need to make sure that you chilled it down and stored it properly. Anyway, that's dinner, such as it is. Let's get that to the table and give it a taste. Okay, well, there it is. And I'm quite happy actually with the way that the a lot of the moisture was driven off. So it has actually dried up a bit, but that's good. That's kind of what I wanted. And I've got my mango, apple and apricot mixture there as well. Anyway, let's have a taste of this stuff together. A bit of potato and a bit of the pea mix. It's barely a curry. It's It, it needs a lot more curry flavour in it. 
Perhaps if I'd actually made half of everything and used that amount of curry paste with half of all the other ingredients, it might have uh, the flavour might have gone a bit further. And despite the lack of curry pungency, there is enough flavour here in those spices, those onions, um, and the other ingredients to make it a dish that does actually taste okay to eat. However, I wouldn't serve this to somebody and tell them it's a curry because it kind of isn't. That fruit mixture, which is mostly mango, does actually work quite well with this. It's quite fresh tasting for because it's obviously a, an underripe mango, but the acidity and there is a little bit of fragrance there from the mango really brightens the dish. Not by any means a high point in the week. I think the best meal of the week was probably those steamed buns when they were fresh, but it's okay. It's more than just okay. It's actually reasonably nice. Now I will probably finish off that fruit just as a almost like a dessert if I don't eat it with the air quotes curry. That's the end of my five days for five pounds challenge and I haven't gone hungry. I don't think I've actually gone short of nutrition as such. I could have cooked I think there were four more sausages maybe three more sausages in the freezer. I could have cooked them to have this with this but I just think sausages in a dish like this there's just no point having them there. So yeah if it wasn't for the lard that I added in the potatoes because that's the only fat I've got this would be actually a vegetarian dish. That's the end of all the cooking part. I think what we'll do now is I'll take some time to reflect on what was good and what could have been better, what worked and what didn't work, what choices I made maybe that were good and maybe that weren't so good. I think I'll also try to answer some of the why didn't you buy X questions. I'm probably going to do that Saturday morning, which is tomorrow for me, but you don't have to wait. So that's coming up next. Reflections and conclusions. Time for some rambling and possibly annoying waffle. Viewing is, as always, optional. To rate the meals. Now, it does help that I'm not a fussy eater, but here we go. Day one lunch, which was veg and sausage stew. That was hearty and warming. Kind of simple and obvious, but absolutely fulfilled my expectations. I'll give this one 7 out of 10. Day one dinner, peas, rice and lettuce. Surprisingly okay, but sort of weird. Only 4 out of 10 for this. Day two breakfast, fruity rice. A bit sour, a bit simple, but enjoyable. Five out of 10. Day two lunch, baked potato, salad and peas. Not only tasted good, but I thought this one looked good too. Seven out of 10. Day two dinner, sausage rolls and soup. It was okay, but sort of ordinary. Five out of 10. Day three breakfast, sad burritos. A nice substantial breakfast, but could have done with some sauce or something. Six out of 10. Day three lunch, sausage rolls and fruit. Now, despite the simplicity and repetition, I really enjoyed this little lunch and the sausage rolls were much nicer cold than they had been warm. Seven out of 10. Day three dinner, onion soup. Really delicious. Despite not being particularly authentic, this one's getting eight out of 10. Day four breakfast, eggless pancakes. Nah, edible. But mostly because I'm not a fussy eater. Three out of 10. Day four lunch, steamed buns, highlight of the week. And maybe it's partly because I was expecting failure and because I was eating outdoors, but these buns were my favorite thing in the whole week, nine out of 10. Day four dinner, stir fry with rice and chili sausage. Very filling and tasted okay, but just a bit lacking in several dimensions. Five out of 10. Day five breakfast, steamed buns and fruit. Nice, but not quite as nice as when they were fresh, seven out of 10. Day five lunch, soup and dumplings. The soup was not great. That stock had too much onion skin in it and it was bitter. The dumplings were nice enough, but not outstanding. Five out of 10. And day five dinner, barely a curry, very filling. And that cooked fruit mixture did help a lot, but this meal really fell way short of what it was trying to be. Four out of 10. Before we look at the generalities of good and bad, let's just go over to Kitchen Shrimp to see what was left at the end of the five days. It's the morning after the challenge and I have got some ingredients left over so let's just take stock of what was left at the end of the challenge. There's one potato, 213 grams. There's this much cabbage, 410 grams. There's just one onion or one onion, 90 grams. There's a little over half the big swede, 519 grams. There's a rather sad little handful of carrots, 127 grams. Now that's going to go to waste, by the way. I will just add that to the vegetable drawer. About a third of the lard left, I think. 105 grams. There's some flour left. 560 grams, including the bag. So, I don't know, 540 grams, maybe. There's more than half of the rice. 620 grams, so 610 grams, excluding the bag. There's a about a cup full of the peas left, 185 grams, so 180 grams excluding the bag. Hey, kitchen shrimp, you forgot about four sausages. And then there's a bunch of leftovers. So there's this leftover stir fry, there's this leftover peas with marmite, and two sad little pancakes that have really gone a bit gray. I assume that's the banana. 
has made them do that. And half of my sourdough starter, which I'm not going to keep going because I don't, I don't, it's like keeping a pet and I've already got one of those. And now back to Studio Shrimp. So what was good in general? Well, it's got to be that big box of veg. Seriously good value and provided lots of scope for different meals. It was also really handy to have some fat just for frying and making pastry and so on. That's often been a problem in previous videos. What was not so good? The limitation, self-imposed of course, on spices and flavourings was just really quite difficult. More curry powder or paste could have made all the difference. More chilli flakes or powder, some soy sauce, a little bit of sugar and vanilla and so on. Of course all those things cost money. The restriction was designed to make it difficult and I think in a lot of cases I didn't really overcome that difficulty. I think if I was doing this over again I might plan for dishes that are more subtle in flavour by design rather than things that just tried and then fell short of what they were trying to be. Not really related to this challenge, but putting out five videos in a week is more difficult than I'd really bargained for. People often remark on the labour intensity of some of the food prep in this series of videos, sometimes saying that nobody has time for all of that. Well, I think that's sometimes true. Some of the prep in the shorter challenge videos was absurdly fussy and time consuming, but not so much in this five day series. In fact, I would say to any extent that these meals look laborious to prepare, much of that's probably only because of the awkwardness of preparing and trying to talk about it and record it on video as well as recording all the weights and measures that I had to do. In total, this series of videos took nearly 100 hours of work to plan, record, edit, analyse and produce. And by the way, that's why I'm not going to spring forward to a 7 or 10 or 30 or 365 day version of this exercise. I'm fairly sure I would have messed up the numbers somewhere or other, but the only meal that was really labour intensive in this week was the onion soup, which had 45 plus minutes of just standing over the pan stirring onions. It could have been an easier week if I'd thought more about bulk preparation of some of the ingredients, like batch cooking all of those onions at once. Could I survive on this food budget indefinitely? Probably yes. Would I want to? Absolutely not. Now as I have pointed out, this exercise is not intended to resemble any real world situation of hardship, but just for one moment let's address that. Does this prove that people on low income or benefits could or should get by with less? No. It categorically does not prove anything like that. If anything, it proves the opposite. This was difficult, not easy. And it was only five days and only about food. Food isn't the only thing that people have to deal with in their lives. Now, a quick look at the shopping and the alternatives. I think the £1.50 box of veg was outstanding value and I can't see much argument to that. I suppose similar, perhaps better bargains are available if you get the timing right for final reduction in other supermarkets, but that seems a bit more hit and miss than this. Now this is going to sound maybe a bit snobby, but I really didn't enjoy those cheap sausages very much. I imagine if you watched the whole series of videos you already got that. Interestingly I thought they were better cooked and cold than they were freshly cooked hot. So why did I buy them? Well, let's look at some possible alternatives. Given that this was one pound for a pack of 907 grams of sausages, containing nearly 2,000 calories and nearly 130 grams of protein. Eggs are an alternative that people often suggest, and this is a fair suggestion. So comparing prices in Tesco, just because all their prices are online and I can do it from my desk here. If you think Tesco is super expensive, you're probably wrong. At least when it comes to the sorts of products that are in scope for a video like this one, I've got another video for you to watch about that. The cheapest pack of eggs is 89 pence for six free range eggs. Actually I had to re-record this segment because there was a pack of six battery eggs for 79 pence that wasn't visible when I first captured the data. That's not necessarily the most economical though. I think that's probably this pack of battery farmed eggs, 15 for £1.18. Some of the other things people suggest, and again most of these are fair suggestions worth looking at. Dry beans, ramen noodles, chicken portions, ramen noodles, ground beef, ramen noodles, cheese, ramen noodles, oats, ramen noodles, chickpeas, and of course ramen noodles. Most of these are fair suggestions, so here's a comparison of various different possible items. Bearing in mind for a challenge like this it isn't just about the per penny value, but actually the pack price as well. So some of these are based on the smallest package I could find because that's probably the one I would have to choose on a limited budget challenge. Assuming we're buying them all for their protein value, I've sorted this by protein per penny. Eggs or cheese, for example, are not at the top, but they are versatile and that alone might be a reason for buying them. I've included a couple of typical packs of ramen noodles since a lot of people seem to think those are a good option. They are a terrible option in most contexts. Don't get me wrong, I got a stack of instant ramen in my cupboard, but in a challenge like this they're not usually a very useful solution unless there's perhaps some constraint on preparation time or complexity maybe, something like that. Dry beans on the other hand are, in terms of protein per penny, good value, and probably better value still when bought in larger quantities than shown here, which is based on the cheapest smallest pack. 
but on a limited budget challenge, a bag of beans could take a big chunk out of the budget, which, sure, covers nutrition, but limits variety. That tension between variety, nutrition, sustenance and flavour is very noticeable when the budget is limited. Nearly every choice involves a measure of compromise on one of those factors, and of course in reality the limitations of my imagination and cooking skill probably shrink that circle a bit, making the compromises all the more severe. So looking at this analysis, it appears chicken drumsticks would have been a better choice than those cheap sausages, except the pack price is £1.42. Great value for sure, but I'd have to decide to drop 42 pence of other things out of the basket. And sure, the bananas were not great, but losing the bananas wouldn't have covered that. I'll also just quickly sort this list in descending order of energy per penny. Pause if you want to have a look at that in more detail. There are some things I passed over, like the cheap spaghetti, but I rejected that on the basis it wasn't so versatile. If this challenge had been to feed a lot of people for one meal, it might well have been spaghetti. So to sum up, the best meals in this week were generally the simpler ones. With the interesting exception of the onion soup, effort doesn't make flavour. That simple sausage and veg stew I made right at the start was more satisfying than the curry I tried to make at the end. The stew knew exactly what it was trying to be and achieved it pretty closely. The curry was trying to be more than it ever could be, given the limited flavour ingredients, and that shortfall made the meal disappointing. I hope it's fairly obvious why I didn't buy any spices and seasonings in the £5 budget. For example, that little jar of chilli flakes would be 85 pence. It's nice, but in my advice, nearly twice the price of a kilo of rice for that small jar of spice. You might be wondering what was the first thing I ate after the challenge. That was a breakfast of eggy in the basket made with butter and olive oil topped with cheese and crispy chilli oil. It was very much appreciated. So that's the end of my five pounds for five days budget challenge video series. I hope you enjoyed that. There was one item in the rules that was permitted that we didn't really make very much use of. I wonder if you can figure out which one it was. For now, thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon.